So a very powerful gospel on forgiveness. What the Lord is saying here is what he says in the Our Father. Lord, forgive us our trespasses, just like we forgive those who trespass against us. That's what's happening here. And whenever we pray that our Father, it is something really to take to heart, that what we're saying every time we pray it is, Lord, I want you to treat me exactly like I treat others. And so if we're not forgiving, if we're not having mercy on those who have hurt us, then what we're saying, we're sort of self-condemning ourselves, saying, Lord, treat me exactly the same way. And so it, it really is a, a very powerful push in our heart to forgive from the heart. And that doesn't mean that we might not struggle because, you know, just like we learned yesterday, St. Jane Francis de Chantel had to struggle with forgiveness after her husband was killed in a hunting accident by one of their family friends. And she had to go through this process of, I'm sure there were feelings of, of anger, feelings of, you know, not wanting to forgive, and yet, in the midst of the emotions, it's important to remember the emotions don't define forgiveness. The choice defines forgiveness. And so you could forgive someone, and yet it still hurts. And yet there's still something in there saying, I don't want to forgive. And yet, if you're able to rise above that emotion, this comes with the grace of the Holy Spirit to be able to say, I choose to forgive from my heart, to be able to go down to that place of the heart and say, regardless of what I'm feeling, I choose forgiveness. That's what we're being called to in this moment. And what the Lord tells Peter here is this forgiveness is something that can't happen on your own. Peter says, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how, must, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times. Seven is the perfect number in this life. It's the covenant number. There's seven days of creation. That was on purpose when the author of Genesis broke up the, the, whole, the whole creation um, description in seven days. He was doing it also to show that this is the perfection of, of creation, God as creator. And so this also shows sort of the perfection of human forgiveness. But notice what the Lord says is he says, don't stop at what you can do on your own power, your own talents, your own temperament, your own ability. Not seven times, but 77 times. In other words, he's raising it to a level of saying, this is impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. You can't forgive and love this sort of way. And, and it goes back to what Jesus would say later, saying, love one another as I have loved you. Or you heard that it was said, love, you know, love your friends, do good to those who do good to you. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And we'll talk about that just in a moment. But we have this debtor, and it says that it was he owed this master a huge amount. Now we might say, okay, well, what is that? You know, thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. So that Greek word there is something that basically is just this amount that you couldn't even imagine. It would be like if each one of you had to pay back the national deficit of the United States. Like, that's how much money. I don't think anyone here can just pay that back right now. That's what he owes. And he begs, saying, I can't pay this. And it's right, he can't. And because the master was moved with compassion, he forgave the whole thing. Do you see how that, that debt, and this is really, again, the the debt of when we sin against the Lord, it, it's something that we just can't work out. We have to have him reach down to us saying, you are forgiven. Because we can't pay back 
the way in which we've hurt our Creator. It's too great a divide, and only He can cross that great divide with His cross in order to heal and forgive that whole debt. And ultimately, He puts that debt upon Himself and destroys it so that we don't have to be bound anymore. But notice, that's the experience of someone who has been saved in the Lord, who has received this, this gift of baptism. But notice how this then debtor uses that gift. He's free, but then he's free to not forgive someone else. So there's this other guy, one of his co-workers. And it says that he owed him a much smaller amount. His co-worker owed this person who was just forgiven this huge debt. Now that small amount is still substantial. It would be something like, you know, several thousand dollars here in our time, which that's still a lot. If someone owed you several thousand dollars, you'd say, you know, please pay it back. But it's something that could be paid back versus the national deficit. You can't pay that back, but you could pay back over time several thousand dollars. But notice what this servant who is forgiven does. He does, he says, pay back what you owe. Then the fellow servant begs and he falls to his knees doing the exact same thing that he did to the master, saying, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But then this is the moment that is disturbing. It says, but he refused. And he threw him in prison. And then the fellow servants heard what had happened and said they were deeply disturbed. Because they knew that he was forgiven by the master of this huge debt. And then he turned around and he wasn't able to forgive something that could have been paid back. Our hurts towards one another are nothing compared to the hurt against God that each of us as sinners created. God forgave us that, but now he's saying, I forgave you the impossible debt. Should you not forgive your brother and sister? The only way that we can forgive our brother and sister, because still, several thousand dollars in hurts, is still a lot. But that's where we need to go back to, the, to what happened to us in Christ. To receive his mercy, to be like, wow, God, you are so merciful. And then it's through that encounter of divine mercy that then we have the ability to be merciful to our brothers and sisters. We can't love them and forgive them without first experiencing this. And if you want a artistic rendering of that, look to the play Les Miserables, which I've talked about a lot of times. Jean Valjean, forgiven in this powerful moment of stealing and could have just been sent right back. And yet he set free. And remember what that bishop says. He says, use this silver, use this moment to become an honest man. And he's changed. And he becomes someone that is merciful towards others because he received mercy. So that's what's happening here. Now, let's talk just a little bit about these two saints today. Because they were people that needed to forgive one another. St. Pontian and St. Politus, for most of their life, hated each other. Which, you know, don't normally think of saints hating each other, but they weren't saints at that time. One of them was the Holy Father. The other was a very, very important scripture scholar, theologian, Hippolytus. Pontian the Pope, Hippolytus, this priest, that didn't like the Pope and thought that he was wrong and actually in time said, you know what, I'm going to become another Pope. So he became what's called the, an anti-Pope. So it was a really confusing time at that time where people were like, well, who's the real Pope? And so Pontian is like, 
he actually was the real Pope, but Hippolytus has had a whole bunch of followers, and they started following him because they didn't like this guy. So they still had all that messiness back then. This is like, this is like 300, 400 AD. And ultimately, they talked against each other, they preached against each other, they didn't like each other, but then they were under persecution by the Roman Emperor, and the Roman Emperor didn't like either of them, because they were both Christian. So he put both of them in prison together. While they were in prison, imagine being in prison with someone that you hate. And yet, as they were sitting there, they actually started to heal, reconcile, because they were under the same threat of death. And they started to realize our differences were nothing compared to what God is calling us to do right now. And ultimately, Hippolytus, who was the anti-pope at that moment, he started to kind of wake up in the midst of that, saying, yeah, I shouldn't be anti-pope anymore. So he actually repented of that, and he said, no, you're the rightful pope. Let's face this persecution together. And together they joined hands and they went into the torture and Colosseum to die together as brothers. And now they reign in heaven as brothers in the same spirit. They were enemies for most of their life on earth, but it was through persecution and through dying together that they were able to reconcile their divisions and love each other and die with one another. It's such a beautiful story because there can be times, and, and maybe you've experienced this, that brothers and sisters in Christ have hurt you. There's been difference of opinions, there's been struggles. I mean, in many ways, this is probably most every single parish in the world, every single diocese in the world, every single nation in the world has these situations and maybe you've experienced maybe someone in a ministry maybe someone that you didn't like maybe someone who hurt you and we're still all still in the same you know we're still all in the same church or so and yet you know sometimes you might see that person and be like oh man it's that person or so well pray to saint pontian and hippolytus because probably when they were in the same eucharistic assembly they probably looked at each other being like it's that guy over there. And yet, they're able to forgive each other. They're able to love each other. And they're able to die for Christ together. And now in heaven, they're like best buds. And you know what's interesting is Hippolytus is the one who wrote the second Eucharistic prayer. So even though he kind of went off for a little while and became an anti-pope, and then he came back and then became a saint, he was so brilliant that he actually wrote the prayer that we usually say, and I'm going to pray that prayer at Mass today, it's the one that we normally say, it's based on his original Eucharistic prayer. So he wrote one of the prayers of the Mass. So pray to these guys. If you ever find that struggle with forgiveness of someone that is a brother and sister in the Lord, ask for that grace of being able to forgive, which only comes from the grace of God.